Creek Bay was just the only spot on that part of the coast where anyone could well live. There was a neat little creek where a boat might lie as snug as a puffin in her nest. And out from this creek was a ledge of sunken rock that ran into the sea. Now when the Atlantic, according to custom, was raging with a storm, many a richly laden ship went to pieces upon these rocks. And the fine bales of cotton and tobacco and the kegs of the Hollands and the punches of rum that came ashore, like Dunby Bay, was just like a little estate to Jack Doherty. He was kind and humane to a distressed sailor, if ever one had the good luck to make it to land. But when the ship had gone to pieces and the crew were all lost, who was to blame Jack for picking up all he could find? And who is the worse for it? said Jack. <laughs> and as for the king, God bless him. Everybody knows he is rich enough without picking what's floating in the sea. Jack, though such a hermit, was a jolly, good-natured fellow. One tremendous, blustering day, when Jack had wandered farther northward along the coast than usual, a storm came on so furiously he was obliged to take shelter in one of the many caves along the shore. And there, to his surprise, he saw a creature with, with green hair and oh, long green teeth and and legs with scales on them, and, and the tail of a fish. And he wore no clothes, but <laughs> had a little red cocked hat under his arm. A marrow. The marrow, they say, are not uncommon on these wilder coasts of Ireland. And so far from being afraid of the marrow was Jack, that it was the first wish of his heart to meet them. Jack, with all his courage, a little daunted, but he went boldly up to the fishman, took off his hat, and made his best bow. Your servant, sir, said Jack. Your servant kindly, said the marrow. <laughs> <laughs> to be sure, how well your honor knows my name, said Jack. Is it not I know your name, Jack Doherty? when I knew your grandfather long before he was married to your grandmother. You and I must be better acquainted. Meet me here next Monday, and we'll talk a little more on the matter. <laughs> Jack and the Marrow parted the best friends in the world. <laughs> on Monday they met, and Jack was not a little surprised to see that the Marrow had two cocked hats under his short, thin-like arms. Now, see here, Jack. Put this hat on. Mind to keep your eyes wide open. Grab hold of my tail, and you'll see what you'll see. <laughs> in he dashed into the sea, and in dashed Jack boldly after him. He held tight to the marrow's tail, as slippery as it was, and at last, to his surprise, they got out of the water, and he found himself on dry land at the bottom of the sea. The sea above was like a sky, and the fish like birds swimming about. They arrived at the Marrow's habitation and found dinner laid. The choicest of fish, oysters and soles and turbots and sturgeons, and the best of foreign spirits. At length, the Marrow said to Jack, Now, follow me, my boy, and I'll show you my curiosities. <laughs> he led Jack to a little room that was filled with odds and ends the Marrow had picked up over the years. But what chiefly took Jack's attention things like lobster pots ranged on the floor against the wall. Might I be so bold as to ask what the things like lobster pots are? Oh, the soul cages. <laughs> <laughs> the what? Sir, these things I keep the souls in. When I see a good storm coming on, I set a couple dozen of them. And when the sailors are drowned and the souls get out of them, the poor things are nearly perished to death, not being used to the cold. <laughs> so they make into my pots. I fetch them home and keep them snug. And isn't it nice for them to be in such good quarters? <laughs> Jack was so thunderstruck he didn't know what to say. <laughs> so he said nothing. Now, the light on the waves of the Atlantic were flooded with a golden light. So Jack, perceiving it was late, set off home. The state of these poor souls cooped up in these 
these lobster pox gave Jack a great deal of grief, and how to release them cost him a good bit of thought. At last, he thought his best plan would be to invite the mayor to dinner, to get him drunk, to take his hat, go to his house, set the souls free. So he invited the mayor to dinner and brought out plenty the best foreign spirits, enough to make 20 men drunk. The mayor was delighted. He laughed and drank and sang and danced until he fell asleep on the floor. Jack snatched up the hat, dove into the sea, and arrived at the next habitation. He went to the cages, lifted them up. Nothing did he hear, nothing did he see, but he heard a faint whistle. Having done all he could for them, he set the pots back as they were and sent a blessing for the souls on their journey, wherever they might be going. This intercourse continued for many years. The marrow never missed the souls, and no one, perhaps, ever equaled Jack in free and souls from her.